Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City Club of Portland, Civ Portland's own Civic Forum. I hope you're all having a great summer, and I'm happy to have you back. My name is Susan Hammer. I'm president of the City Club. First, a reminder to turn off your cell phones, pagers, and other things that beep ring and break into song. Before we begin, I'd like to announce that we have a visa card that was left in the back of the room of the initials HP. So if your initials are HP, you can pick it up right in the back as you leave. The guy in the blue shirt will have it. A few announcements. Uh, next Friday's forum, September 15th, is called Oregon's Omnivore Dilemma. It's co-sponsored with Ecotrust with representatives from Burgerville, New Seasons Market, and Portland Public Schools. This should be a great program, and I hope you will all come. Our Citizens Read uh, for this month also focuses on a food theme. We are going to be reading Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma. The Citizens Read will be held on September 25th. It's open to the public. It's free, but we would ask that you call ahead and um, RSVP. Uh, if you buy your book from City Club, we do get 10% of the sale, so we'd appreciate that you do that. Details on this and other events that are going on City Club can be found in the weekly bulletin or on our um, website, which is uh, www.pdxcityclub.org. And while you're on the website, you can find information about membership, our TV and radio broadcast schedule, and of course, the Citizens Blog, our online forum. You can listen to today's uh, Friday Forum online, or you can purchase a CD or videotape if you like. I'd like to welcome a new member here today and ask her to stand and be welcome to City Club. Her name is Megan Vidal. Megan, could you please stand? Thank you. And as you probably know, if you've looked at the fall schedule, there are wonderful things coming up at City Club. There's enormous interest right now in what we're doing, and I'd like to invite all of you who are guests today but not members to join City Club. You can pick up a membership application in the back of the room. We are so fortunate in Portland to have great corporate citizens. We have two who are our quarterly sponsors, and I'd like to thank them for being quarterly sponsors. They are Kaiser Permanente and Stoll Reeves LLP. Please join me. <clears throat> Our program today is about the city that we love so much, the home of innovative public transportation, great retail and businesses, easy pedestrian access, interesting architecture and beautiful public spaces such as the Esplanade and Pioneer Courthouse Square. But all is not well here in River City. There are some subjects that are hard to discuss publicly but occupy many private conversations. We have too many ground floor empty office spaces in downtown Portland. We've heard from shoppers, workers and business people who avoid downtown because they don't like dogs, they're annoyed at unpleasant smells, they're tired of being panhandled, and they're frustrated by having to work around construction obstacles. Some prefer Pearl, the 23rd, Hawthorne, or even suburban malls. And then we have the upcoming construction that will place light rail on the city's bus lines. So what are we going to do about all this? We are fortunate today to have four excellent, excellent knowledgeable individuals, further riches of our city, who are going to help, our, help us see our way through this. John Freganese, principal in Freganese and uh, Calthorpe Associates, Gil Kelly, uh, Pre, uh, Portland's planning director, Ruth Scott, president and CEO of Innovation Partnership, and Gary Reddick, president of Siena Architects, will moderate. 
John has been a planner for 30 years and formerly was the planning director for Metro where he led the development of Metro's 2040 growth concept. John was raised in Rome. He's been involved in downtown plans in Chicago, Denver, Dallas, New Orleans, and numerous other cities. He's a cook and a traveler, and he enjoys looking at our city, state, and nation from an international perspective. Gil Kelly, to me, uh, in the middle over here, has served as planning director for the city of Portland since year 2000. He's been a key figure in the South Waterfront, the River District, the West End, Hollywood, and St. John's, as well as the city's river renaissance and industrial revitalization policies. Gill is now starting work on major updates to the Central City Plan and the city's comprehensive plan. Gill is a newlywed. He lives in the Pearl with his stepdaughter and his wife. <laughs> Ruth Scott founded Innovation Partnership in year 2000, one of Portland's most visible leaders and successful advocates for community improvements. Ruth previously served for 15 years as president and CEO of the Association for Portland Progress. Under her leadership, AAP developed and managed groundbreaking programs such as Smart Park Garages, the Clean and Safe Program, Homelessness to Work, Panhandling Reduction, the District Development Program, and Portland Guides, to name only a few of her accomplishments. The light of her life is her 17-year-old son, who is a senior at Grant High this year. Daughter. Daughter? Oh, sorry. Got that wrong. Highly offended. All right. Thank you for that correction. And finally, Gary Reddick will be our moderator today. Gary is a recognized architect and expert in urban planning and smart growth. He's been leading Siena Architects' work in China. He's taken 11 trips in the last 18 months. He's also an artist with shows in the Pacific Northwest. Gary was formerly president of the Architectural Foundation of Oregon. He was born in Baker City, Oregon. I think it was just Baker City back in those days. Gary is the proud grandfather to four seventh-generation Oregonian granddaughters, and he bats third on Siena's uh, league softball team. Gary. Thank you, uh, granddaughters in softball. I've got my priorities straight. Thank you, Susan. Um, I am really pleased to be a part of this program today and to have worked uh, with this panel and a larger planning and research group uh, over the summer. Uh, we met a number of times uh, to try to shape this program. This group included Mike Lindbergh, uh, who can't be here today, but I know is listening. Is Portland downtown in trouble? Does it have the sniffles? Or is something much more serious at work? That we're here talking about this today is exceedingly timely, if not urgent. Why isn't downtown just roaring right now with everything else that's happening in the city? A New York Times article in the summer of 96 stated, as six of the 15 fastest growing cities in the nation come of age in the West, spilling into forests, deserts, and mountain valleys, the only urban area that appears to be conscientiously trying to reshape itself as a new kind of American city is Portland. So many have been invested in our progress. That same summer of 96, on a weekday night much like this week, several of us from the office walked up to Pioneer Square from our storefront offices three blocks away. It was 11 p.m., kind of de rigueur for architects. The square and its surroundings were lively and full of people of all ages. At the corner of Broadway and Morrison, I was approached by an older couple. I could say that then. As they would inform me from Chicago. And as they clutched each other, they quickly added, is it safe to walk around down here? I also click, quickly tried to give them every assurance that it was, and they ventured on. I remember being amused, but I also most remember being shocked by the question. That that area might not be safe had never occurred to me. It just was. I went back to that same corner this week. 
545, the same corner, that same storefront at Broadway and Morrison is now vacant and has been for over six months. That's a 100% retail corner in retail speak. I crossed to the square only to find myself in a homeless occupation, a square under siege. There was no place to sit or walk. Dogs, cats, blankets, bedrolls, camouflage gear. This was our living room, spoiled. I stayed long enough to observe a well-dressed woman, probably a visitor, threatened with being beat up if she didn't stop taking pictures of the square. I helped to hurry her away as she was about to be attacked. She probably had read of Portland's famous downtown and square in a travel magazine, or in a book, or perhaps in Dutch architect Jan Gell's hardbound book profiling the world's best public spaces with Pioneer Square on the cover. Something has changed. What is it? What does it mean? Do we care? Dirtier streets, sidewalks, excessive vacancy, excessive panhandling, drug busts, locations called Needle Park, Needle Alley, nightclub district shootings. Something has changed. These activities until recently had never been included in the same sentence with Portland, Oregon. Right now, we all have way more questions than answers. Questions like, as other areas emerge, become vibrant, and attract our attention, have we misplaced our affection for downtown? Is downtown a central place, or are we becoming a place of centers? The Pearl District, South Waterfront, Lloyd District, Northwest 23rd, the Museum West End, Hawthorne Division, Alberta, et cetera, et cetera all supporting retail and their services for close by residential. And then add Bridgeport Village and its retail clout into this mix. Is it, as some would say, a management issue? Can additional management improve the situation? Vision is not a series of organic events. Do we have one? Do we know what it is? Will it work? Do we see downtown as a real special place that we get dressed up for? And why should we care at such a small area anyway? We have the right panel and the right audience to begin a frank discussion of these concerns. So today, we are going to be looking at downtown, past, present, and future, followed by your questions. Ruth Scott will discuss how downtown became the internationally recognized city it is today, and she will be followed by John Freganese, who will discuss the current state of downtown based on the data we have collected, such trends as the office market, the retail market, population changes, employment changes, and the business perception of crime and safety. And finally, John will be followed by Gil Kelly, who will discuss the implications of this data and his view for the future of downtown. Ruth? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure and I have to say a little bit strange. I have two jobs here today. One is to provide a basis, a framework for looking at downtown. What is it that makes up a downtown and helps it really work? And my other job is to be the ghost of Christmas past. Talk about the 1970s to 2000. And that's my framework and we're going to do it in a hurry apparently. So. First of all, I want you to think about downtown kind of like a body. It's really very organic. It has two major components. It's got its infrastructure and it's got its management. As you know with your body, you may have great bone structure, good muscles and stuff, but if you don't maintain it, it doesn't work, does it? So those are the two pieces we're going to focus on today as we run themes through this, infrastructure and management. And as I start into infrastructure, let me quickly thank Brian Scott from MIG for loaning me his notes. He's recently been teaching a class at Portland State, and I, I couldn't find my old downtown speeches, I have to admit it, <laughs> so I was able to grab his. So infrastructure, here we go. And as we weave through this, I'm also going to hit planning, and I want to remind you that planning is a tool, it's not an outcome. So the two outcomes are the infrastructure and the management. 
So first of all, in terms of infrastructure, let's, let's acknowledge that nature gave us a couple of very important things right out of the gate that we can't take credit for. We got the river and the hills and downtowns between it. Those were two wonderful gifts. And then our forefathers gave us those wonderful small walkable blocks that helped the city have just a terrific sense of place. And of course, we got some parks with that. Now there's two very essential elements to infrastructure. One is office and the other is retail. Then there's some secondary pieces, transportation. Some people will argue that transportation is a primary piece. I would say no. People don't come downtown to drive unless they're cruising. And I would say that cruising is a retail activity because it's very much like window shopping. So transportation, housing, parks, art, uh, culture, those are all secondary elements which are very important to downtown, but our primary pieces are office and retail. Those are our infrastructure main pieces, the balls we have to watch. On this basis in the 70s to 2000, we started off with a downtown plan that gave us wonderful, wonderful structure. We got a commitment to transit, a commitment to open space, public-private partnership around design, a commitment to retail, one of those essential components. We saw a strategy for cars develop, and of course we saw the office spine, which was the core of our downtown. And what we got out of that plan was a terrific transit mall we, with an office focus. We, got, we moved the freeway away from the river and ended up with the access to the river and the parks. We ended up with fountains. We searched for our center and found Pioneer Square. In the 70 to 75 range, we had a wonderful office surge and another one again in 81 to 85. So it strengthened our economy and gave us good, strong basis on which to build. And then in the 80s, along came our retail with Nordstrom and Pioneer Place, our two essential elements of the infrastructure coming into play. Then the secondary pieces came along. Um, particularly, we saw lots of benches and art and sidewalk vendors. Let's, let's remember how important things like sidewalk vendors are. Have you been to a city that doesn't have that activity on the street and how sort of bland it is? They're an important part of it. So let's remember that we've got to have this good bone structure. And I know I've whipped through that, and I hope as I did it, you, can, you kind of visualize all those things that we've got in our downtown, and I hope you'll keep those in your mind as we talk about management. Because management has four essential components. And as we think through management, there's a lot of layers to these four components. There's a lot of hard work that goes in there. First of all, there's organization. It's the people behind it. Who's the leadership? Who's in charge? Who's taking control and responsibility for the management of this wonderful place called downtown? The second is promotion. You know, we gotta sell ourselves. You know, whether it's how we dress, if it's your body, it's how you look, if it's downtown, it's what it looks like. It's got to have good promotion and marketing. Second is our design. I mean, third is our design. And fourth is our economic restructuring. Those four components are essential to the management of downtown. So all four have to be in place for it to be functional and working. So if you go back to the 70s again, we got a back to our downtown plan. It gave us the basis for that management. It gave us an economic analysis that let us know what we needed to do in terms of economic restructuring to get the, the downtown that we have today. It gave us a commitment to a 24-7 downtown, one that was open 24 hours a day that felt like a place year-round, day in and day out. A commitment to retail and a strategy for bringing in all kinds of retail so that downtown had that sizzle and excitement. I'm sure you've been in downtowns that are all office with no retail. And let's be real, there are very few downtowns that are all retail with no office. You have to have an incredible tourist base to support just retail. And the city got in the parking business. This is an, a significant piece of downtown management. 
Finally, of course, our Portland Downtown Association started and that launched the organizational piece. And there are several people here today that were part of that. I'm not talking fast enough, we'll go faster. Okay, organization, we got our Portland Downtown Association, fairly soon the Association for Portland Progress, and of course today that's the Portland Business Alliance. That organizational piece has done quite a few things through the years, including five-year strategic plans. We've done lots of advocacy for downtown, policy work around transportation, light rail, housing, panhandling, culture. We've developed a whole lot of programs and services in those areas. Promotion includes special events. You can think of all the special events that are downtown, essential elements of keeping it well managed. Um, overall downtown marketing, we've had uh, radio, TV, lots of newspaper supplements, all an important part of promotion. And then of course there's retail specific. Pioneer Square events have been an essential part of keeping downtown exciting and vital. And it goes back to that sense of if we don't keep our living room tidy, it reflects on us overall. That's part of the promotion. Um, South Park blocks, Waterfront Park, the North Park blocks, all have had wonderful events that have helped keep the interest alive in our downtown. And of course with retail we brought in Smart Park and the marketing there that connected to the retailers. Another piece of keeping retailing easy to get to. People don't come downtown to park but they do come downtown to shop. Design. We've done lots with the look. We worked with our property owners and an essential part of design is the cleaning. And it was our property owners who got behind the clean and safe and made it happen, made it clean. When people are pushing brooms, people feel like it's being cleaned. It's what does downtown feel like as part of the design. Of course, we added the security to that and the sidewalk patrols. An important partnership in the whole thing was the public-private partnership behind cleaning and security. And then, of course, also the policy work and the marketing that went with that. Other elements of design that have come along through the years is the holiday lighting program and the storefront displays, the cleaning and the street furniture, banners that are all part of it. And finally, economic restructuring, I'm gonna give you one example. The perfect example of economic restructuring and all the work that goes into it is what's happening to Myron Frank these days. You constantly have to be working at a downtown to respond to the economic changes, the needs of the community, and the cash flow that causes a business to be active. It's the job of downtown management to make sure that businesses can succeed, survive, grow in a good environment. Office, retail are the essential parts of the infrastructure. The four points of management are organization, promotion, downtown, uh, design, thank you, at economic restructuring. Infrastructure management, essential to downtown Portland. That's how we got where we are in less than 10 minutes and in 30 years. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Um, you know, when I first came to Portland in 1974, uh, downtown was a really drab place. It was a time in the United States, as I'd just gotten out of planning school, uh, where people thought downtowns were dead. And uh, it was really amazing to see what happened to Portland when it started coming around, when the waterfront park went in, all the, the mall went in, all these things started happening. And it was a real inspiration to me. I mean, it was an inspiration when I was planning director of Ashland. I would come to Portland and go back and try to recreate what I was seeing at a small scale. Ruth actually helped a lot, uh, giving us some, some tips. Um, it was internationally known. It is internationally known. People all over the world hear about Portland. You go to Italy or you go to Brazil and you're from Portland, they all know about Portland downtown. Uh, it was really like a beautiful garden that was really well tended. It was so, it, it had so much of a caretaker event. So when we started our consulting firm eight years ago, we of course moved downtown. And you know, we have a Fifth Avenue address. It's pretty Tony, pretty upscale. Um, we have, uh, our uh, employees love it. We love being downtown. We love all the things. And we've been there eight years. And I speak not as a planner now, but as a downtown businessman, because this is where I make my living, uh, exporting planning to the rest of the country. One of the things we've really enjoyed doing uh, since we started the firm is working in cities that have some challenges. Working in cities where the most important thing isn't where you're going to get your next latte, but really dealing with fundamental issues. We've worked in Southside Chicago 
in Southside Dallas, and in Compton. Now, given the demographic of the City Club, I, don't, I know you don't know about Compton, but ask your kids. Compton is south of South Central LA. Compton is the home of Dr. Dre and DJ Quick, I'm sure popular with all you guys. Um, Compton is a place bursting with potential, uh, full of creativity, a lot of hope for the future, and a really big problem. They have a lot of gangs and a lot of drive-bys. So I was in Compton earlier this year talking with them, figuring out how we're going to help, how this works into the whole problem. I get a call from my office. There's been a drive-by on Fifth Avenue. The young man has crawled to our foyer and is bleeding. My wife calls back later. She works at the office uh, along with my son and says, you know, it's okay. The police, uh, the, the, they took him away. They're hosing the blood off the sidewalk. Uh, the police are questioning any of everybody, should we let people home, uh, go home today, or, or should we, is it safe to keep them in the office? There's been some repercussions from that. Uh, the first is I have a lot of street cred in Compton. Uh, people there, you know, figure that we know how to handle a drive-by, <laughs> which is not, a, not a, something I really uh, wanted to be known for. Um, we thought about the last couple of years, though, how it's gone downhill. Uh, how the drug deals that are going on outside our office, our, our employees take a morbid pleasure uh, at watching uh, these transactions and the police go by and they scatter like cockroaches under light and then come back out as soon as they're gone. Drug users, people smoking crack uh, inside the foyers, you know, constantly seeing that. Not constantly, but every day, once a week. Um, vacant storefronts, my, my wife and daughter are afraid to walk during certain times. Our lease is up, should we stay? Should we move to someplace safer? Is this, is what's happening? What's going on? When we got together, I was tasked with looking at some data from other cities. And so we looked at a variety of sources and found kind of a mixed bag. I mean, everyone knows that the larger downtown, the Pearl District, now the South Waterfront, is doing well. We've seen a lot of housing go up. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that downtowns all over the West are doing well. I looked at San Diego. During the last five years, we've added 2,700 housing units in Portland but our employment's been flat. We lost 5,000 employees downtown after 9-11. We haven't gotten back to where we were five years ago. In the same period of time, San Diego added 6,600 households and 9,000 jobs. Seattle added 3,500 households and 12,000 jobs. Um, right now, looking back five years, retail is down by 10%. Finance and insurance employment is down by 10%. In the last five years, we've doubled the number of people walking and biking to work, went from 5% to 10%. That's very good. But the number of people taking max to work has gone from 20% to 14%. The number of people driving to work alone has gone from 44 to 48%. Pedestrian counts downtown have dropped by 8% in the last two years. Now, you have to say uh, that things aren't all bad and things are getting better. Vacancy rates are coming down. People are investing in office condos. They're making that, that uh, investment. Attitudes, when you survey people, people are not down on downtown, in the downtown. Uh, they have good attitudes. They're actually thinking things are positive. And, and it's, uh, uh, I have to say, the police have been making a real effort to combat crime, uh, fewer drugs, and at least the people now look like they're scared and they're running from something. I noticed that difference in the last few months. On Saturday, uh, all of a sudden, we see the, the, the clean and safe officers out, and uh, the front of our office went from the streets of Deadwood from the, to the streets of Mayberry. But you have to say, really, when you look at the downtown, our momentum that we built up in the, in the 80s, in the 90s, has stopped. We're clearly uh, not going nearly the way other places are going. Given that this is an era in our, in our country's history where downtowns everywhere are doing well, not just Seattle and San Diego, but Los Angeles, Oakland, Denver, Salt Lake City, Boise, they all have these booms. What's happening with our downtown? Um, so we're left in, in, with questions. Is it, is, are me and all my friends paranoid or is something really happening? Um, is this a garden untended with the caretaker gone? And I think, uh, We've gone through the ghost of Christmas past and the ghost of Christmas present. I guess I'm the one that introduced you to Tiny Tim, given Dickens' thing. And now uh, Gil will show you uh, Portland future and what we can do about that. Thanks, John, for that easy task. Um, you know, we've been asked to keep our, our remarks brief, so there's time for questions. So. Um, 
given my well-known reputation for brevity, I think I'm going to skip over uh, uh, much of this very eloquent introduction I had, except to say a couple of things. Um, I'm going to talk this afternoon uh, very briefly about uh, what I would humbly put forward as some challenges to the collective body that cares about downtown and the central city, um, both for short-term, uh, near-term challenges uh, and for the long-term. Uh, knowing that I play some role in, in, in both of those. Um, and they're going to be aimed at everybody. So uh, if I give equal offense, I hope I'm doing the right thing in that regard. Um, I just would say, for starters, that um, like John, I'm a student of downtowns and central cities uh, in this country and around the globe. And um, I just feel very proud to be a Portlander and very glad that I'm in my job. Uh, I think the legacy that we have been left uh, by Neil and Bud and Vera. Isn't it great how we can just say their first names and everybody knows who we're talking about? And all the others of you who have worked in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, and from the neighborhoods to make this place the place it is, gives us a huge advantage, in my view, over almost any other city, uh, at least on this continent. Um, so I think that's really a starting point. And the starting point is also that that thinking has expanded really out in many ways to the metro level. So we really have a metropolitan diagram that is the key planning document, thanks to John's hard work and many others, that reinforce the notion that a core central city is vital to the health of the entire region. That's, that's a presumption that we make, and, and we're very lucky in that regard. We're not really debating whether we should have a healthy downtown or we should have some polycentric model. We know we should, and it's really a matter of, of how we do that. Um, so I think that's very important to understand, just, just for starters. Um, and, I, and I think the, the companion to that philosophy is that it takes all of us pulling our weight, a very intentional effort to make that happen. It doesn't happen because we draw the lines on the map. It doesn't happen automatically. I love the spirit that's reflected in those plaques downtown that say, we planned, it worked. Um, I'll amend that phrase a little bit later because I think there's a little bit more involved in it. But it, it just shows the spirit that Portland has in that regard. Um, but here's the thing. Um, downtowns and central cities are highly dynamic places. Um, they're the most complex and the most dense, the most active places in any region. And that means we have to pay constant attention. And I think we should sort of face up to the fact that we've let some activities slide over the past few years. As Ruth said, it takes active management of what's on the ground in all the categories that, that she talked about, promotion, design, marketing, um, organization. organization, managing the, the actual day-to-day -day nuts and bolts, the partnerships that, take that, that make that work. Um, it also takes forward-looking planning. Some of that is being done constantly, district by district, spot by spot. But every once in a while, like I believe today, we have to step back a bit and take a look at the fundamental issues about where we're going. Our 1988 Central City Plan, which um, was the successor to the 1972 Downtown Plan, is now pretty much out of date. We've, we've done a lot of what that called for, and in fact, we've outstripped it uh, in many ways. So I think there's a challenge to all of us there to re-engage in that forward look, just as there's a challenge to us to not only think about planning, but to actually re-engage collectively in what it takes uh, to manage the downtown. Um, I want to say that on the first part, on the management question, I think this is actually very doable. Um, we've done it before. And there's some very good signs that are happening, activities that are going on right now. And I want to just say a number of those because I wasn't quite sure what to make of John's statistics since they do tell a mixed story. But let me just give you a few um, other facts about things that are going on and I think are trending up. Um, the clean and safe aspect that Ruth talked about, the effort that's been stepped up between the mayor's office, the city in general, uh, and the PBA, for example, for presence on the street, a program that began last October is actually showing results uh, in terms of street behaviors that John uh, reflected in his points. Um, and it's also uh, assisting people getting into drug prevention and drug rehab. This is a very, very powerful tool because that perception of safety and sociability of the street 
is a starting point for everybody in terms of wanting to be downtown and use downtown. The city's campaign, now a year and a half old approximately, of ending homelessness, particularly chronic homelessness, is a very powerful background piece to what's going on to the health of downtown. Um, events like last night's kickoff of the time-based art, uh, PICA in, in uh, uh, Pioneer Square, just wonderful how much we've actually been using the downtown and using it for a whole variety of different audiences and users. Um, and retail, I think we should talk about retail. We, we, we all know the vacant uh, storefronts, we've seen the four lease signs. Uh, I'm not sure those are dramatic by American city standards, but they still trouble us as Portlanders because we see them all the time. The good news is though that uh, Myron, and, Myron Frank's being taken over by Macy's. Macy's is putting a major um, shot in the arm to downtown. The risk of having lost that department store downtown would have had serious repercussions and thanks to the effort of, of the previous and current mayor and to the PDC, uh, that was avoided and I think will be a real shot in the arm. And I'm very um, honored and pleased today to be able to carry a message from um, Nordstrom's national uh, headquarters to you today that they are planning a major store um, uh, rehab and reconstruction in 2007. So our two key anchors downtown will really have been shored up, very, very uh, important. And of course we all hope the Galleria gets reused quickly and, and hopefully we'll see some very hopeful signs there. Um, the creation of an office to an independent and privately funded office to market downtown is, is an extremely a good and hopeful sign. Um, the improvements, frankly, to the city's permitting system that have been going on for the last few years have taken one more hurdle out of the way for business reinvestment. Um, so those are, I think, really important things. And if you add to that the background context that the housing market has actually been driving a lot of activity downtown, um, not all of these show up in John's numbers, which are actually occupied, but for the last um, approximately three years, we've been producing about 3,000 housing units a year in the central city. Um, there are three to four major office buildings in the, in the wings, in the pipelines. Whether those get built and occupied is a question, but there's confidence at least to put them forward in the um, permit process. The art museum expansion, the girding theater, these are huge investments in our center and in our core and should give us confidence that many of us do believe in the long-term health of downtown. Hotel capacity has expanded in recent years. The streetcar has arrived and is now giving us that perceptive, perceptible link with other districts um, that ring the downtown and a way to get around downtown without cars. Um, and the transit mall is coming, uh, both good and bad. Uh, it'll be a little tough for a while during construction, but it will bring a whole lot of people downtown and extend extend them right up to the university. Um, so here are the challenges I'd like to issue for the short term. Um, first, that we evaluate the progress on the clean and safe activities, the partnership between the city and PBA to improve street behavior. It's a good experiment. It's showing early positive results. We need to keep that focus. And so that's a challenge to both the city and to PBA. The retail, we need a retail strategy. We don't really have a concrete one to three year retail strategy. And again, I think uh, PBA should take up that charge uh, with the PDC to really get a very concrete marketing strategy for retail. Um, I would say we should also market Portland, not just to outside businesses who may want to come here, but we should market downtown to the rest of Portland and the region. Those are our customers. We got to get them down here. Um, the transit mall, a challenge for those, and there's a very active mall management group working there, which is public and private, to actually view this not just as an infrastructure project, but also as a management long-term maintenance and programming concern. The right concepts, I think we're all going to have to help and do some heavy lifting there. It's going to be a big disruption, but a huge opportunity as uh, downtown evolves. Um, Finally, I'd like to say that this long-term question about the equity or not of the business license fee, business license tax, needs to be taken on and taken on directly. 
And I think there's no easy answer here. It's an important signal to the business and investment community that the city is willing to talk about that. But at the same time, the business community needs to understand it has to be equitable. And there are things that we pay for here that you don't get elsewhere. Um, and that the city has to be held revenue neutral in some way. I think there's a pathway forward, particularly if you look at the equity between small and large businesses there. And the mayor and Commissioner Adams are working very actively on that with the PBA. Um, I'm running out of time, but I did want to get to the longer term future, so I'll try to do that very quickly. Um, just to say, what might the central city look like 30 years from now? We did a lot of the planning we're, we're uh, implementing now 30 years ago. What might it look like 30 years from now? Well, we might grow from 30,000 residents in the central city to 75 or 100,000. We might grow from our current 80,000 jobs to easily 120,000 jobs. There are a million new people coming to the region. The only question is, by what year? 15 years, 20 years, 25 years? They're coming. Do we want to capture that energy downtown? I think we want to capture a lot of that energy downtown. And so how, uh, how do we do that? And we can have streetcars everywhere. We'll probably have a baseball uh, park. Um, we'll have more green streets. We'll have all kinds of features that people are talking about. But none of those aspirations uh, happen automatically. They take very thoughtful choice making and planning. And uh, so for that reason, I want to issue a challenge to those of you who will be involved, and I hope all of you will, in the upcoming planning process for creating a new plan for central Portland because the downtown is bigger than the old downtown. It's not confined by Burnside and the river and the freeway any longer. It's the central city. Uh, and that's what really puts us on a map uh, with some of the other major cities on the continent and around the world. So very specifically there, and I will wrap up, um, we need to take on the following issues. Workforce housing is the central city a place for high and low incomes only or for middle incomes and potentially for families? Is it a place to have incubator businesses or only professional services? Will there be a stronger university presence to really drive the economy in the future? Will it be kid friendly, regardless of whether those kids live in the central city or come in from nearby neighborhoods or throughout the region? What is the desired urban form of our, of our city, of our skyline? And how do we want to transfer development around? All these issues that have been raised lately by these, uh, these projects have raised those. What is our strategy for acquiring needed open space for parks, plazas, and green spaces? If we don't think about that now, it'll be too late to lock those strategies in place. What do we do about the, the uh, freeway and the access to the river from the east side? I think that's a huge challenge for us to think about. We can't put it off much longer. Those things take 15 to 20 years once you decide what you're going to do to actually get them fixed. Thank you. We need to be mindful that we are a radial city and need to continue to extend the streetcar and light rail systems to feed the interior uh, of the region. And I would posit that we need to take on in this next generation of plan making the question of energy, energy production and energy savings. Find a district, a sub-district of the central city and make it uh, zero sum energy production and conservation. Really, really mind that, put ourselves on the map. I hope we can do all those things and you can add other issues as well. I hope you join us in the central city planning process. And probably the closing comment I would make echoes back to what Ruth said. We need to find a new model for partnerships. In this era of diverse leadership uh, in both the public and private sectors, we need to find new ways to collaborate and make these decisions. So please, you're all invited to participate. Thank you. In my opening, I asked, uh, why should we care? The human spirit of a place matters, and that spirit always emanates from the center. The core of our identity, like most well-regarded cities, is wrapped up in what we say and exhibit at the central parts of where we live. In Europe, it has always been so. 
Cities in America are always fragile and they will always need our investment. A Greek proverb says, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. We need to invest. Now let's get to your questions and, and, uh, of the panel and answers, and I'll remind you that many times at the City Club, the answers come from the audience. Thank you. All right, as it's been uh, mentioned, we tried to move things along so that there would be plenty of time for questions from the audience today. Um, a privilege of membership is to ask a question. In this context, a question is not a speech. It's actually a question that ends with a question mark. It takes less than 30 seconds. Um, and I, I think it might be helpful if you direct it toward one of the speakers. Uh, our first question will be asked by our board host, John Horvick. John is a member of the City Club Board of Governors, and he is co-chair of the New Leaders Council. Um, he is project director for Parents and Children Together, which is a study at OHSU. John. Thank you all. As a downtown resident and a daily user of public transportation, I am concerned about the transit mall developments or, or uh, work coming up. And Gil, you were very positive that you think it's going to work well. Can you please tell us more about how it's going to work well and some of the challenges? And you asked, um, so it's going to take lots of heavy lifting from all of us. Uh, what is that heavy lifting all about? Can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Um, well, I think this is, will be a major disruption to downtown any way you look at it. When it's done, I think it's going to be a wonderful service to downtown. But part of that depends on sweating the details, keeping businesses informed, keeping sidewalks open, keeping disruptions to a minimum so that we don't choke off businesses during the time of construction. Uh, it doesn't take much for people to drive into downtown once, get stuck in, a, in an endless loop, and then not want to come back again until the project's over with. I think we need to try to avoid that circumstance. I also think, however, it poses a great opportunity to sweat the details of how do we open those storefronts? What do we do with only half the shelters there? How can we recapture the use of that part of the sidewalk? How do we animate the spaces with, with lighting and with better landscaping? And, and with public art, this is a huge opportunity. And I think getting the word out to people and the images out to people of what it's going to look like, just like you see in airport construction. This is what it's going to look like when you're done. Sorry for the inconvenience is a huge, huge message. And that's going to take all of us to, to take that out. Mike Pullen, City Club member. I'll direct this one to John. Um, at the same time that downtown appears to be stalled or struggling, Portland's neighborhood business districts seem stronger than they've ever been. Uh, could you comment on this or help explain it? And could the strength of the neighborhood streets be partly at the expense of downtown's health? I, I don't think that they're uh, at the expense of the downtown, but it has been amazing to see the neighborhood streets. And frankly, those are the places that are competing, in my mind, to, if I was going to relocate, it'd be to a Portland neighborhood. Um, but I think what's happened is that downtown got a lot of attention, beca became a lot of inspiration, a lot of people got skilled uh, basically at the construction and the method of, of doing business in, a, in an urban center, and that's expanded not just to Portland neighborhoods, but to neighborhoods all over the region. And I think downtown got neglected. I think uh, we took our eye off it, and a lot of things kind of went by the side, and the downtown is the old place. It's not the hip place. It's not the new place. And I think uh, rein reinventing that, re rediscovering it is a big part of, of what will bring that back to downtown. The fundamentals of downtown are good. Uh, I think the, you know, we've taken our eye off the ball, certainly in the last five years. Downtown has had a crisis, had a wound. We haven't been really addressing it until recently. And I think, uh, as Ruth said, uh, it's not just the infrastructure, it's the management that has to go along with it. Mac Pritchard, uh, City Club member. My question is for John as well. You talked about the growth of other downtowns in western cities, uh, places like San Diego, Boise, Salt Lake. Do they offer lessons uh, that Portland should be following as we think about uh, the future well, of our downtown? Well, they do. They, they copied Portland in many cases, except for Seattle, which would never admit that on its deathbed. But, <laughs> but most other places have been inspired by what happened to Portland 10 years ago. 
And I think they do have, um, they have been more aggressive about recruiting business and, and development. I know we get a lot of flack in Oregon when we try to partner with private businesses, but frankly, uh, uh, other states would, would make you blush what they do to get businesses downtown. So I think we have to continue to really target and, 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 and recruit people uh, to the downtown. I think that's been one of the changes that, that you see in other places. They're pretty aggressive. They also have, uh, you know, identified the big partners that will bring things downtown. In Salt Lake, it's the Mormon Church. The Mormon Church is moving a lot of students downtown. All of a sudden, they have 10,000 new residents, uh, and it's really, really changing Salt Lake. So we have to find, of course, we don't have the Mormon Church, but big partners that we can work with. Hi, my name is Leslie Hildula. I'm a member of City Club. And I, want, I guess I want to ask a management question. I think it was last week we saw the headlines about the kicker money coming back. And we know that the county and the state social service agencies are starving for money. They don't have the funds they need to do the work. And the problems that came up in your presentation were issues around crime, drug use, people stuck in real negative places where they need help with law enforcement and social services. So if this is one of the bigger problems I heard you talk about, then don't we need to look at how we fund our social services in the state and in the city before we can really improve downtown to keep and attract more. And who, I don't know which one of you would like to tackle that question. Certainly a basic part of management is working with your partners. And re realistically, it's about advocacy. It's about constantly working with state government, county government, city government, other nonprofits. It, it, it's a partnership. Downtown is, is not an isolated thing, and it's impacted by all these decisions that are going on everywhere else in the state. So at the same time as you have people on the street working to help homeless get back into housing, helping to get people with Project Respond who are on drugs back into the mental health system, is, is you're working constantly, daily, to help the people there. You've got to also be working on a parallel track of, of partnering, solving the political, social, and, and policy issues in, in that whole other kind of global realm because they're coming down. It's the long-term work as well as the short-term work. So in summary, management is, is a two parallel tracks, what you're doing on a daily basis and what you're doing working, looking towards the future and seeing problems coming at you and doing everything you can to mitigate them. Uh, Andy Robeson, club member. And I must, I, I recently moved downtown within s the last six months and I must admit I was somewhat chagrined to learn that the be all and the end all was retail and office always thought that residents were important uh, for the vitality of downtown and the eyes on the street kind of approach to crime prevention I thought was a real thing. But be that as it may, I am often at Pioneer Square daily, all hours, day and night. I have never had a single incident where I felt any sense of fear or lack of safety. How much is this really a perception? The, the characterization of the well-dressed, supposedly someone we want there, versus the not so well-dressed, maybe even the great unwashed. What, what is the answer to this? I mean, is it really perception versus reality? And what can we do uh, to solve it if it is, in fact, a problem? I think that's a really core question here, and, and we wrestled with it as an entire panel. I think that maybe an unsatisfactory answer for you is that it's probably both. A lot of it depends on where you are downtown. Places like Pioneer Square that are heavily programmed may not offend uh, or people as much as some other pockets of downtown. Some places feel very edgy to people, and so it's a matter of sort of personal uh, tolerance as well. Uh, but we hear anecdotally a lot about people's um, discomfort in, some, in many corners of downtown. And I think that to the extent perceptions can start to drive reality, you need to pay attention to those signals. Like you, I live downtown, and I'm not as bothered by many of those. But many people are. And downtown should be a place where everybody feels like they can be. And so I think that's really important to pay attention to. 
if, if a, a mall goer gets offended, I can understand that because they're used to the sanitized things. But all of us on the panel we live and work in downtown. We're, we're, we're not, we know the difference between someone who is, is talking to themselves but is not harming anyone to, to someone who looks scary and is threatening. And we have felt that. I mean, I'm, that is a perception, but I felt it and, and the other people in my office have at times. It's gotten better. I have to say that too. These are issues, though, that come and go, and that's why you need constant management. We've, we've had problems like this off and on all through the years. It just needs constantly working on it so that when it crops up, as they say, you work on it and bat it down. It's, it's part of society. We're human. This is not a machine. That's why it needs constant oiling. Uh, John Moreland, a club member. Um, my uh, question really kind of takes off again on, on the issue of management. And the general question, and I, I really want to ask it two ways. The general question is, management is important. Who's going to do it? The, the, the narrower uh, question I've got is, I have the sense that to have a really vital place like downtown Portland, there needs to be a firebrand. There needs to be a personality on it. There needs to be somebody that stands up. And I'm interested in any of your comments on who's going to do it for Portland. Um, I'm specifically interested uh, in, John, your comments working in many cities around the country. How often are those cities that you named that are doing really well? Is there somebody who stands up and says, this place is my own and I'm, you know, is the leader, it says the downtown matters and drives a myriad of activities to make it, to make it happen. Well, okay. I think, and it's not just big downtowns, it's main streets, someone has to wake up every day that their job is to take care of the downtown. That's the gardener, uh, uh, the caretaker. And I think that is something that, that really has to happen. I think in the, in the heyday of Portland, you had the APP that was focusing on that. That's merged with, the, with the, business, the Portland Business Alliance, and I'm a member of that organization. I support it. But I think sometimes you really need to have uh, almost a skunk works within an organization to really be able to focus it, that the whole organization doesn't have to go along with stuff. There really needs to be a focus on the downtown. And I'm not complaining about the management, but I think and I know there are people whose responsibility is the downtown, but there really needs to be kind of a more dependent, direct uh, responsibility feedback and, and, uh, and, and focus on downtown, even within the PBA. Uh, and no criticism meant to anybody. I just think that that, when you look at other places that are successful, there, are, there is a person who was, who was doing that. And Ruth was that person for years. And you knew if you had a problem, it was Ruth, and she was advocating. And, you know, that, that's something that I think is, is important to have a person that does that and that that's their job every day and everyone knows who it is. Let me defend myself here a little bit. Um, yeah, you can have a person, but if there's not a good, strong organization behind that person in partnership with that person, you don't have diddle. What you have is a showpiece or a show person. So when you're thinking about it, you're thinking about a, a leadership group that's supporting downtown, a leadership group that wakes up every morning and says, what do we need to do today? So this is a partnership thing, and it's, it's business that needs to be there, it's government that needs to be there, and it's our community that needs to be there, which includes our residences, by the way. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry to say we're out of time. I expect many of the speakers will stick around if you'd like to come up afterwards and ask your questions. I'd like to thank John Friganese, um, Gil Kelly, Ruth Scott, and Gary Reddick for being here today. I think this is a great start to a discussion that I hope we can continue. I'd like to thank our members and guests for your participation in the program today, and again, invite our guests to join City Club. There are membership forms on the back table. I'd also like to thank our TV and radio audience for your interest in the City Club of Portland. If you'd like to continue the discussion, please go to the Citizens um, uh, blog on, on, on the City Club website, and we are adjourned. Thank you.
Thank you.